here. I don't want to record. Recording right now. Here we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning uh, to uh, to uh, the wine industry. Uh, yes. This is Bruno Laclotte. I'm the owner of Regency Wine Nevada and uh, Regen and Hillside Wine Spirit in California. Uh, you all my clients. You all the people what I'm working with. I'm very yeah, happy to have you. California t-shirt for Mike. So today, very happy to have uh, one of our top winemaker in the, in the industry uh, producing for us, uh, obviously, a beautiful line of product called Scarlet Wine. Scarlet is in Napa. Uh, this is a beautiful estate with the Maga family. And um, we do have Mike here then in charge of the winemaking that is going to tell us about the philosophy. Maddy is also listening to us. Maddy is the uh, owner slash, uh, I believe, uh, operation director of the Scarlet Estate, the Maga Estate with the uh, with the different wines. Uh, Ray, good morning. Good morning, Ray. Really appreciate that you're here this morning. How are you, sir? Uh, Carol is right here. So uh, thank you to be so consistent, uh, Coral, to be uh, next to us in a Friday morning meeting. Uh, I do have uh, Sam. Sam on the top corner over here is uh, our she's guy. He's going to talk to us about she's pairing at the end of this session. Is uh, at Custa. It's a local restaurant. I mean, a local wine shop. She stopped next to my home. So it's super convenient. I didn't get the cheese. I promise you that I'm not going to be the only one eating cheese. But Sam always tell us about the she's uh, uh, pairing, which I think it's a, it's a good touch to have. It give you some ideas to run your program as well. Um, here we go. So I think I pretty much get five minutes to everybody to uh, join us this morning. I want to thank you again to be part of this uh, session. Uh, this is a trade session, only people from the industry. So we're going to have uh, prices that we will discuss later on. But for right now, very happy to have Mike Smith, uh, head winemaker of Scarlet Estate, MAGA. And thank you again, very, very, thank you very much, Mike, to be a uh, part of this uh, Zoom meeting. I know your time is uh, precious, but thank you. And uh, tell us a little bit more about you and tell us a little bit more about this project, your philosophy. Let's share the passion together. Yeah, so that's, that's like a, a long story. So back in 2009, uh, I was interviewed by Sherrit and Maddie, uh, amongst other people, and thankfully they picked me. And it was such a blessing to be chosen to make wines from, you know, I believe it's 54 acres uh, of, of the Magaw Vineyard, which is broken up into two blocks called Alsace and Heritage. And it's an amazing terroir. It, it stretches from the Silverado Trail on the east side all the way down to uh, Kong Creek. And th the most amazing thing about, about the Magaw Vineyard is, is that the terroir goes from, you know, the east side from the trail where Alsace is. And it's very dry over there. And you have this red, rocky, volcanic soil. And then the slope slips down into uh, the rest of Alsace and where it's basically perfect for Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. And then as you get into Heritage to the, to the west, it gets uh, even rockier as you get closer to the Kong Creek. And uh, it's not obvious, you know, rocky soil, but um, the Heritage Cab that we make, uh, which is predominantly the reserve cab, comes from that side of the, uh, of the property. And as you get closer to those alluvial flows, so alluvial flows are basically where the rock has been deposited from either creeks or landslides. And um, it, it, there's, it's so diverse, you know, and I think one of the best things about redeveloping the property and picking what we're gonna plant is we're, we're actually planting uh, varietals that fit exactly where they need to be on the property instead of, instead of just planting all Cabernet, you know, which is predominant in Napa because it brings a higher price or whatever. And um, so we specifically pick uh, spots on the 54 acres to where 
the terroir fits the varietal. Got it. Yeah. So you have Sauvignon Blanc, you have uh, Petit Verdot, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, obviously. What else do you have on the property? We have Grenache, Semillon, and then we have a couple blocks that we're planning to Cabernet Franc and Merlot. Got it. Which is yeah, we, we, uh, we know about your uh, Grenache as we're working with Carl Anderson, another one of our top uh, producer. And he's, he looks like, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, buying the grape from, uh, from you guys, from the uh, Maga Vineyard and the Grenache. Yeah, correct. And, and so we've been making, have you, I don't, I'm not sure if you guys have had the, the, uh, the Scarlet Rosé. So the Scarlet Rosé is from the Grenache Blanc. Got it. Uh, Blanc, sorry, not Blanc. What am I saying? Um, so we pick that at 21 bricks and it's a thinning pass. So instead of like doing a thinning pass or a, a green harvest, as they call it, mm. and dropping it on the ground, we actually pick it at 21 bricks and we make, we make the Scarlet Rosé. Got it. And so it's 100% Grenache Rosé. Okay. And um if I, if I may say, Mike, I'm going to go back to the philosophy of winemaking, but before we uh, go a little bit more further, first is the most important is we cannot just talk during those meetings if you don't have a glass of wine. So my advice to you is get a glass of wine, open up the Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> uh, you will see that really help. That really help to open up your mind. I want to cheers to all that. I want to cheers to all you guys to be part of this industry, to share the passion with us this morning. Uh, Maddie, can you hear me, Maddie? Can you, uh, do you want me to do the uh, Scarlet presentation as far as the history of the family, or can you just do it for us? Uh, whatever you prefer, Bruno. Yeah, yeah Maddie, you me? Maddie, thank you. I don't know if you, I don't see you, so I don't know if you were. <laughs> I'm here, I promise, I promise. Okay, Maddie? good. Uh, Maddie, can you tell us, obviously, introduce yourself, please, uh, to everyone, and can you please tell us a little bit more about Scarlet, the, uh, the, the, the project, uh, the family, where it's come from, just for the people to understand what the name of Scarlet is, but also the, the, the MAGA family uh, history. Of course, of course. Uh, well, thank you all. Nice to meet you over Zoom. Uh, hope to meet you in the future sometime soon. Uh, a little bit of history about the MAGA family. They have a big sports background. Um, Sherrit Riker, who is the principal of Scarlet Wines, his great-grandfather, uh, was one of the original founding partners of the Oakland Raiders in 1960. Um, so he and a couple other partners founded the Silver and Black and in 1963 hired Al Davis to come in and run the show. And so they had a great uh, stretch. They held their ownership of the team until I believe 2005 or six, um, at, which is coincidentally right at the same time that we launched uh, the wine brand together. So. Share it uh, as the great grandson of the uh, original founder of the Raiders, um, and I launched this partnership uh, to make value affordable wines, but that were worth thousands of dollars. Um, we were really turned off by um, a lot of the Napa wines that were kind of available at the time, and and the you know. Uh, big, big heavy hitters, I guess, that were just seeming to be kind of price, price gouging um, their customers. So our, we set out to, to produce something that is amazing and Mike is thankfully providing that for us um, uh, without kind of gouging people on the price. So uh, we hope you guys can see that as well. In terms of the name Scarlet, that is actually Sherrit's daughter's name. Uh, she is just graduated from high school and is off to Auburn for college in the fall. So um, along with the, the storylines of the family and the property has been in the family for almost 30 years, uh, we wanted to keep the wine brand aligned with that. So it is a family name. It's Sherrit's daughter. Um, and I think uh, that, kind of, that kind of touches on everything with the family history, Bruno. Got it. Super. Thank you so much, uh, Maddie. So we're up north. We're in Napa Valley. We're in Rutherford District. Uh, the family, uh, the, the vineyard is owned by the family, what, since the 1970s, uh, Maddie, or earlier than that? The Maga um, estate. When did the, the family... Sorry, uh, 1990. 1990, that's what the Maga family uh, purchased the estate. Correct. 
Got it. And we are making, you are making Scarlet wine since which vintage? 2006. So 2006 was the, er, that was the first vintage release. And what was, what was the Cabernet? Was uh, something else? Just the Cabernet, correct. Just the Cabernet. Okay. What is the total production today of Scarlet? Across all varietals or just the Cabernet? Yeah, all the, vari all the varietal, yes, total. Oh, geez. Uh, Mike, help me out here. I think that uh, we've grown a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah, I got you, Maddie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. How many cases do we produce, uh, Mike? Yeah, so we're doing about 150 cases of Petit Verdot, uh, 150 cases of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, roughly 1,500 cases of regular Cabernet. We call it the regular Cabernet and then uh, 200 cases of the reserve Cabernet. Got it. But now the, obviously the property, as you mentioned to us, is 55 acres. So obviously you're producing more grape than you're actually producing Scarlet. So the rest of the grape, I believe, are sold to other uh, uh, winemakers like Kel Anderson, Julian Fayard, and some other winemakers over there, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah but you know, the last couple of years we've bumped up production of the regular Cabernet to 3,000 plus cases. Okay. The reserve in the 18 vintage will be, oh, 275 cases. Got it. So we are increasing step-by-step. Step. You have the ability to use more of the grape and step-by-step, step, uh, where do you want to be, uh, Maddie? How many cases total do you want to be in the next five years, we'd say? I say we'd like to kind of cap out at five or 6,000 cases total. Okay, so still manageable, still uh, a program, and I believe, Mike, uh, that's the size of uh, production that you like to work with? Absolutely. You know, I mean, the thing is, uh, the, the patchwork of the vineyard allows uh, for the Cabernet Sauvignon to blend so many different blocks. You know, we, we have A3, A8, H3, um, you know, and I do separate picks. So like, you know, with like A3, we do two picks and A8, we'll do, we'll do three picks. And so what we do is we, we bring in, um, you know, several blocks. We don't, we don't pick it all at once. We don't have the tank space a lot, you know, to bring in like, you know, 15 ton to ferment. And so we, we definitely, we bring in uh, these blocks at different times. So we have a blending component. Uh, of all these blocks, you know, yeah. to create the best wine we can. And so some wines will come in, a, you know, not early, but maybe earlier than other blocks so that maybe it retains more acidity and then we'll, we'll hang some stuff to get more richness and more phenolics uh, for color and flavor. And, and then we can blend these, you know, to create uh, a much more complete wine. Uh, whereas like the, uh, the Zinfandel gets picked all at once. We also made a 2018, uh, petite, petite Syrah. I'm not sure if you guys have had that yet. It's amazing. No, by the way. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. So we made, uh, 175 cases, 200 cases of that in 18. And, um, you know, so it's an, it's a, it's an ebb and flow in the vineyard. You know, we start early with the Sauvignon Blanc and then it's a, it's a vineyard that, we pick over the course of about a month and a half to two months, depending on varietals. And uh, like I say, it's a good patchwork to, instead of picking everything at once, and then, then, then the, you, that's all you have, we can, we can uh, create natural wine that doesn't need additions of say acidity or other things. And we can, uh, we can we can put it all together. Okay, so it's a micro cuvee pretty much with a different layers, I mean different pickup day where you're going to have a different multitude, different cuvee to blend at the end and, and to make it in a more natural way. Your philosophy always been like that? Are you working differently with Scarlet or the Maga Estate than you're working with the other project that you're working with? As you are a wine I mean you you're a consulting winemaker, right? You have different projects on you under your yeah. So, yeah, most most of the other projects I work with are you know, two or three ton lots. And so you pick it all at once. And so there's, there's much more, um, you gotta, as I like to say, like you have to nail it. You know, you, you, there isn't like you're, you're gonna do three picks 
you know, with my other clients or my own brands. And with Scarlet, you can actually pick, you can pick blocks so that you can blend them together and create, you know, what, what, what the terroir from there, you know, can, can produce. Okay. When you say that, Sorry, when you say natural wine, uh, you, you're, you're obviously taking uh, in consideration the usage of sulfide during vinification. Tell us about your philosophy of making this one the most pure, for what I understand, to uh, usage of uh, sulfide. I mean, what is your philosophy of those uh, biodynamic, organically natural wine? What, where we have with Scarlet, what is your philosophy? Well, you know, the term natural wine, there's natural wines, as we all know. You know, they can be orange wines. They can be all, all kinds of stuff, no sulfites. Uh, my, my term for natural wine is that I don't have to uh, acidulate. I don't have to add acid to the wine to bring the pHs down. I don't have to use enzymes. Uh, other, um, you know, in the winemaker's handbook, there's all kinds of tools that Especially you, in California, for what I understand. Absolutely. There's all kinds of tools that you can use to mimic artisan winemaking or, and you, like I say, you can add acid, you can add this, you can add that. And so I, I don't do that. I just basically, like, when you have scarlet wine, you're, you know, you have grapes. Uh, of course, I add SO2 because I want to keep things fresh. You know, it's, it's an antioxidant. But um, I had, you know, just like a couple nutrients of the yeast like, and I always add yeast. I never do natural ferments. Um, but when you drink the wines, you're, you're, not, you're not getting anything from the textbooks. You know, there's, there's nothing in it that uh, mimics winemaking or pump overs. It's kind of hard to articulate it. Um, but you have to nail, you have to nail the fruit in the pick and then bring it in you add like a couple things to it and then you make natural wine Got it. so it you, you can you can you can think about like uh like when you when you have processed food right so yeah. it sounds like you're saying the less mad chemistry involved correct absolutely and so when you drink Scarlet or all my other wines that I make, you're not, you're not getting that, you know, you're, you're getting like the only nutrients I add to the ferments are superfood, which is basically dead yeast holes and thiamine and B vitamins, and then diammonium phosphate known as DAP, which is food grade ammonia, uh, which is present in grapes anyway anyhow yeah mm -hmm. and it's food grade ammonia and that's what the yeast use to metabolize themselves to grow and, and and turn sugar into alcohol and so every wine has dap in it in superfood yeah but so many other things that you can add i mean i'm sure you guys have heard of like mega purple and other crap yeah yeah but we're, so, not do we're not doing that with scarlet no no, and so you, when you drink Scarlet and you drink other wines that I make, you're not ingesting uh, processed wine. Yeah, it's a very pure to me. And, and that's why I like to describe Scarlet wine uh, when I make my presentation to be the most pure, elegant expression of the terroir of the, the Rutherford district. Uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. Has everybody enjoyed the Sauvignon Blanc so far? Uh, you can all jump in right now. Tell me, just wave your hand. Tell me which one or who want to talk a little bit more about the Sauvignon Blanc, what you feel about the Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe you want to, somebody want to give me a little yeah, description why don't, of the Sauvignon why don't Blanc. I, why don't I just give you a briefing on the Sauvignon Blanc? Yes, please. Go ahead, uh, Mike. Um, so the Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Maddie might be able to correct me because I don't know how, the age of the vines, but I'm guessing 20 plus years. It's, uh, it's clone one, uh, which is known to you know, UC Davis, which is also known as the Tokalon clone. So, you know, the Tokalon, if you go to the, you know, if you, if you go to 
Sauvignon Blanc that's grown in Tokelon with Mandavi. That's clone one, but it's also known as Tokelon clone. Mm -hmm. And the vines are planted in uh, Alsace at the bottom of the slope. And they're, they're thick and gnarly, maybe two ton per acre, two and a half ton per acre, uh, super concentrated. And, um, you know, going back to what I was telling you about how people want to plant Cabernet Sauvignon everywhere in Napa Valley, other people would have grafted this or replanted it to Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's perfect Sauvignon Blanc territory. And um, the beautiful thing about this block um, is that it, you can pick it at like 24 bricks of sugar, 24.5, which equates to about 14, 14.5 14, alcohol. And so going back to that, I don't know if you guys know. So if you ever want to take bricks, so if someone says it's 25 bricks, if you do point with, with white wine, you do like, you times it by 0.6 or 60%. And that's what equates to the alcohol in general. Got it. So you do 25 bricks times 0.6, and that's about the potential alcohol, give or take uh, a 0.2 or more yep. on the inside or the upside. And um, the, But the beautiful thing about this block is that you can pick it at a, at a potential 14.5 alcohol, and the acidity, the pH level is like 3.3. Three. And... And that, that is like perfect. So you have this richness uh, of, of the ripeness. And then you have the, the low pH of 3.3. Three. And what we do is we ferment it in roughly, don't quote me here, I don't have the notes here, but roughly like 25% stainless steel. Uh, and then the balance of that will be used oak, French oak. Uh, anywhere ranging from anywhere from one year to three or four years old, and then one one new French oak barrel. So one, roughly, one, barrel, one, one brand new one. Yeah. So every year uh, we bring in one new Serre. It's a barrel called Serre uh -huh. from France, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a barrel that is. It, so when when they make barrels, they usually bend the staves with. Uh, with, with fire or heat. Mm -hmm. And, and Sari, the, the immersion barrel is made by bending the staves to make the barrel with, with steam and water, hot water. And so what it does is it leaches out a lot of the tannin, a lot of the phenolics from the wood. So it's a very subtle new barrel. Uh, but what you have to do when you make Sauvignon Blanc is you, 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 you can't just keep using barrels every year because eventually when they're 10 years old, they're dank. Uh -huh. you know, they're old. And so every year we use one new barrel. We reintroduce that as the second year. Uh, let, me ask you, let me ask you why you're using uh, barrels and woods uh, uh, to your Sauvignon Blanc. Is it the Sauvignon Blanc? as it is with no uh, usage of or aging of wood will be as bright as it is right now? Well, I use, I use wood because it, it, it allows, it allows the, the Sauvignon Blanc, just like red wines, to get some oxygen through evaporation. And it, 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 it introduces a little bit of richness to it, you know, and so we use this, you know, two stainless steel barrels, some used wood, one new barrel. And that's the complexity. It's all uh, about the texture, the mouthfeel? Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. And so the wine, and then the wine, whether it be in stainless steel or the barrels, it stays on its lees until we rack it into tank to bottle. For how long? So we bottle it in March. So usually we pick these wines. Uh, and that's the beauty of, of the block for Scarlet is we don't pick it like early August, like a lot of Sauvignon Blanc is. We'll pick it second week of September. Wow. And we can still retain that 3.3 three pH. Yeah. And uh, introduce richness along with the acidity. Got it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
Does anybody want to tell us uh, what you feel about this uh, Sauvignon Blanc? Thank you, Mike, for the descriptive of this Sauvignon Blanc. Does anybody want to take the leads? I know I have Jake. He's always up to it, and he's really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have Koald, and he's doing a very good job at this. But uh, I, again, I'm not the one. Uh, I don't want to impose anything. Who's up to it to describe this Sauvignon Blanc, the, the, the feeling that you have when you drink this Sauvignon Blanc, guys? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, there bring you go. Jason. Jason is here. I'm Come going on, to unmute it. you. Am I on? I'm unmuted. Okay, there you go. I'm allowed to talk. Good and morning, I'll... Jason. Thank you to be with us. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I was very interested in, in when Mike was talking about um, p picking several different times and, and having that complexity add to it to where you have, uh, and then also the use of, of the different barrel system as well, giving it that you have the fresh aspect of it where you have the real clean fruit, you have the high acid, um, but then also having the one from the barrel where you get a little bit more texture, let the grapes hang a little bit to get the ripeness uh, and the final, uh, um, to, to add uh, different layers of flavor to it, which is yeah. what I was most impressed with, with the Sauvignon Blanc. And then to actually hear that it used oak without getting cedar and oak flavors in, in there, and then the description of how he steamed the, steamed the, the staves to, to, to bend them. Um, I find it unique uh, in a sense of Sauvignon Blanc that I've tasted from California. Um, you don't typically, typically when you get the texture, you get more of the oak components in there as well, where you don't get that real heavy oak, but you do get that texture from it, which, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Yeah, I believe I believe these layers that you're getting on the palate, uh, yeah. it's very is very uh, complementary to a food pairing, yes. and some of the Sauvignon Blanc that we have are more like aperitif Sauvignon Blanc. They are like uh, easy, clean, and and they're still good, but they don't have these layers and this complexity that you can have to do the food pairing. And we all in the food industry, I mean, food and wine industry, and we Correct. love to bring over something to the guests where you can really walk with the pairing aspect of it like yeah. you were saying you can go you can go much further than aperitif or yeah. shellfish uh, you can get into some other dishes uh, that this would still complement quite well just because of those layers and that texture and the and the weight i like the weight definitely uh which uh which uh, flavor go go ahead I, on that note i mean i have to give kudos to the terroir of where this is planted so it allows me to retain that freshness and still get the textural qualities out of it. Yeah. You know, and that, that's not my winemaking, that's a terroir. You, you're very modest, uh, Mike, but I know also that if you don't understand your terroir and you don't understand your vineyard, it is no way for a winemaker to make a good wine. So it's just also the relationship that you have at the vineyard. And I can feel that you're very passionate about this. And I really appreciate the winemakers then deep look at their vineyard, do look at their terroir before they're starting to say, I'm going to make a wine this way. So it, it's obvious that you're very attached to that and it reaches add, to the quality of the wine. I would yeah. add, I would yeah. add, Mike, it, it also has to do the, with somebody knowing what to do with the terroir and, yeah. and the fruit that it produces, so. Yeah, so Thank the best, you, Jason. Thank you. Best, so with California terroir, Obviously, we're 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 like a, you know, we're we're like Tuscany, you know, in a sense as as far as like, you know, ripeness. You know, we're not Bordeaux, we're not Washington, and the best vineyards in California, when you can find them, are the ones that can retain acidity, so that you don't have to manipulate. Yeah. And so one of the greatest terroirs outside of Scarlet that I, I work with is the Petaluma Gap. Not, not to segue here, but, you know, for Peter Noir and other things. And, and Chardonnay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, I was talking to, sorry, I was talking to Tom Rinaldi yesterday, and we were talking about his Chardonnay from Petaluma Gap and Chensey's Vignal. And he was telling me exactly the same thing about the pH, uh, very important. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's a lot of terroirs, whether it be Mendocino, Sonoma, Napa, you know, the Sonoma Coast. I know it's very romantic to be, you know, like five miles from the ocean on the coast of Sonoma. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you're going to retain acidity. 
And that's the beauty of Scarlet's Vineyard is that it, it's it, it, across the board from every varietal has that ability. Yeah. You know, and, and if you go a 16th of a mile south or north, maybe it doesn't have it. Yeah. You know? I, I, the, the complexity on the mouth, I'm just getting uh, more to test the wine. Obviously, I, I, I'm testing this one very often, but I, I get this very white flower as well. So it's a combination of this white flower and I do have a little bit touch of clove to it. Uh, it's very velvety, very great texture. Anybody else want to add anything before I ask Sam? to uh, give us a little uh, food pairing. I mean, the cheese pairing with this one. Sam is up to it. Look at that. He's ready to go. Uh, hello, hello, Sam. Hey. Hello. Hey, thank you. Hey. Thank you, yeah, thank yeah, you so thanks for, for having special. me again. Thanks for taking yeah. the time. Let me shut this phone up really quick. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess for me, the thing that I really enjoy about the Scarlet Sauvignon Blanc and the Cab as well is they both have really long, expressive finishes. And when pairing cheeses, so many cheeses have so many layers and kind of evolve as you, you know, you eat them. Um, but I love that both these wines really change as they go along. For the Sauv Blanc, do you attribute that to the blend of grapes? Or what kind of, how do you get that, that quality in the wine? Or do you strive for that? Or Well, Mike, uh, it's, it, you can answer that. Pretty much it's the, uh, we talk about the layers of, um, of the fruit, which is the intensity with the pH. But also it's because Mike using this technique of uh, uh, aging or using w wood, the neutral, neutral oak, uh, to give more of the texture of the wine. But Mike, if you want to add anything to it, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, I mean, you know, using the stainless steel and, uh, you know, over time, like I was saying, you, 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 when you make white wine, if you're going to use uh, used oak barrels, you have to introduce at least if you say if you're going to make 200 cases ish you have to introduce a new barrel every year because you can't you can't just have these old barrels just keep getting older and so eventually so we've been making the sauvignon blanc since i think 2010 uh-huh and so every new barrel that gets introduced every year goes into the arsenal of the used oak okay and so eventually you end up with, with every new barrel ends up being the used barrels. And there might be, you know, once used, twice used, third used, fourth used. And, and, and you, you end up creating a wine that is, you, you want to make something that's kind of consistent, of course, you know, every year to year. But I'm, I'm, I don't adhere to making a wine taste the same every year. So every wine that you're going to get from Scarlet is going to be a reflection of the vintage. Of the vintage. Correct. You're still doing, you're still doing irrigation over there, do you? Oh, correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, irrigation in California is something that doesn't have to be employed fully, um, but that's something that we work with our vineyard management company uh -huh. to make sure that it's not it's not something that you do like automatically. Or overdone. Correct. It's not like, like every year needs this type of irrigation. And well, you transcribed that and you said that was a two ton an acre, which is a very uh, modest uh, production level. So I believe you definitely using irrigation, but you're doing this in a moderate way. Yeah. Yeah. But these vines for the Sauvignon Blanc don't need a lot of irrigation. They don't. They're, don't. they're deep rooted. They're old. They're on perfect soil. Yeah, 27 years, uh, Maddie confirmed to us, 27 years old vine on the Sauvignon Blanc. Whoa. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing piece, you know, and, 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 ben, and unfortunately at some point we're going to have to rip it up and replant it. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, not yet. Let, let, let us walk on the Sauvignon Blanc for a little bit. And, and uh, you're only making 150 cases of the Sauvignon Blanc, you said? Yes. Yeah, so that's very, very small to production, guys. Extremely yeah, small. Good, good, good. Um, I want to uh, move on to the uh, Cabernet, if you don't mind, because we obviously have a lot of things to talk about. 
Uh, Sam, we'll come back to you with the, uh, you will tell us about the cheese plate with the Sauvignon Blanc and the Cabernet on the same time, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. That can be great. I, w I, wanna, I wanna talk about the Cabernet, which is a big uh, part of our business. You know, people asking for Cabernet. I, I have this conversation with Alan in Vegas all the time. I say, Alan, why you just sell Cabernet in Vegas? Can we sell something else in Cabernet? He said, no, Cabernet, that's what the people want. So we're here to provide what they want. Now it's a lot of different Cabernet in the market. Uh, and uh, what I love about the Scarlet uh, Cabernet personally is the uh, brightness, but also the elegance again. So for me, Scarlet make a lot of sense as far as the name as the label, because it really represents the purity uh, of, of my uh, uh, winemaking, but also very elegant in style. So let's talk about the Cabernet. Mike, tell us about your philosophy of the Cabernet, what you do with the Cabernet to make this such a special one. Yeah, so once again, I mean, this is a blend of, of blocks from, you know, mostly Alsace on the east side of the property on the Silverado Trail, uh, combined with uh, the heritage block called H3 in H4. We, we replanted H4 a couple of years ago, so there's no, there's no H4 in this. Uh -huh. um, but once again, you know, the thing about the Scarlet Vineyard uh, on the east side on the trail is you have this very shallow, rocky soil that slopes down from the Silverado Trail, and um, and and we'll we'll pick that first. And so we have A8, and we have A3. So A8 generally three three different picks uh, from the slope down to where it becomes flat, where it abuts the Sauvignon Blanc vineyard that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and so what we do is we do, gosh, in, in the 17, we did three picks of Alsace 3. We did three picks of Alsace 8. And we did two picks of Heritage 3. And, and so, you know, especially with 17, is that, is that what everyone's trying to 17? We all on the 17, everybody got 17. Yeah, and so in 17, because of that, we had these huge heat spikes, you know, where roughly, you know, we, we got up to 113 degrees, right around Jason, Harvard. Uh, Jason, uh, he looks like I kind of give you the wrong vintage, but that's uh, well, okay. I'm, I'm looking, it does say 16. Okay. Yeah, it's 16. You're lucky. Lucky. Lucked out. It's 17 for us. Yeah, 16 was a little more textbook. But yeah. in 17, but in 17. Only the best. Only yeah. the best for Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in 17, you kind of had to hedge your bets. Um, and so we did, you know, three picks of A3, Alsace 3, three picks of Alsace 8, uh, two picks of Heritage 3. And, um, you know, we, we didn't know exactly what we were up against because, like, the, the weird thing about 17, when you get to 113 degrees for roughly a couple, three days, um, the vines get into a shutdown phase. And what the vines do is, is, is uh, it's an amazing thing when you're out in the vineyard. You see that the, the, the leaves will be full, and then they'll curl, and then they'll turn away from the sun. Uh -huh. And they don't uptake any water. You you can you can put five gallons on each vine, and they nothing, will not. Nothing's going to change. They just literally shut down. Huh. And Too hot. Heard, yeah, if you've heard about that before, they literally they do no uptake into the sapwood, and but what happens is when 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 the heat waves are over, you know the vines the leaves will then open back up, and the vines will uptake, and so. If you dump a ton of water on it, thinking that you're going to save the fruit, um, what will happen is like you'll when the vines shut down, they will they will go higher in sugar or bricks, and the minute that they go out out of sh shutdown, they will suck up the water, and you can go from 27 bricks and spend in, in 17. Maybe you spiked out at 27 bricks, and the minute the heat wave's over, you go down to 24.5. What was the 2017 uh, situation? Uh, what was your bricks? 
So that that was a, that was that was a, an anomaly in seventeen, where okay. where like there's a, there's a number one rule and never forget this, from a winemaker's perspective, you never mm-hmm. pick on a heat wave. Never. Never pick on a heat wave. It's too hot anyhow. Correct. <laughs> and so when people will panic and they see like it's 113 degrees and your, your sugars go to 27 bricks, which you can do the point five. It, actually with Cabernet Sauvignon, it's not a 0.6 conversion. You can times the bricks times 0.58 or 58%. That'll give, that'll give you a potential alcohol. Got it. Um, but if you pick on that, then you're picking underripe fruit potentially or not phenolically ripe, and that's why you don't pick on heat waves and so in 17 that was very very uh the the, the most extreme i've ever seen okay and, so, and we got the fire we got the fire and obviously the price didn't really help on the 2017 since we released the 17 in the market not just your wine it is in general uh, the price really think then every 2017 vintage are obviously smoke. Uh, obviously, we are testing 17 for the majority of us. Uh, this is the one that we're releasing right now, and I don't smell any of the smoke. So, can you tell us the situation uh, during this fire about Scarlet and about McGavignon? Yeah, and so we we picked we picked all these blocks prior to the fire on October 10th. Got it. Actually, it was October 9th. It was the night of October 9th. So somebody called you, then it's going to get a fire, so you pick it up earlier. Uh, we picked it prior to that. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> we like, like to say something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a hot year. So, you know, and the weird thing about 17 with other people is that they, they, saw the, they saw the sugars run on the heat waves. There was three of them. And then, um, and then you had the reversals of the sugars, you know, and so we picked it right in the middle and, um, you know, we didn't want the fruit to get too ripe. Too ripe. Yeah. And, you know, there were, there were vineyards that were picked after October 9th, of course. You Got know, it. We, we picked all of these prior to that. I, I, I don't see any smoke and I'm not really, uh, I definitely as nothing is high on this wine. And, uh, you know, the price sometimes they, they take something as a majority and to everyone is like that. So it's actually more challenging for us to test 17, but I believe you find some great jam and great prices on the 17. Alan from Vegas did have a question. He didn't wave his hand, but he does have a question. So go ahead. Uh, I don't have a question. I want to ah. raise. I want to raise my glass today ah. to somebody special. It's uh, Mr. Cut, who's here. Happy birthday, Michael! Thank you. Thank <laughs> He's you. Right here. He's writing a silly cut. Happy birthday! Happy He's birthday! From Lago in Las Vegas. I know. That's great. So thank you for coming on your birthday. Thank you for working hard because I know you're from. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so right. birthday, you know, and congratulations because I know Michael for a long time, and he start uh, he start young as an assistant um, at the Palazzo, and now he's at the Bellagio, and he passed uh, advanced sommelier, and um, yeah, I think congratulations, it's advanced. I mean, pleasure being here. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's uh, he's going. He's definitely a rising star. In Las Vegas, he's young but a rising star. Happy birthday, Michael! Happy birthday! Thank you, Alan, to uh, mention that to us. Uh, thank you and happy birthday, Mike. Tell us a little bit more about this uh, Cabernet. What is your in your sense? Uh, what you accomplished with this this Cabernet? What you're proud about? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, this Cabernet Sauvignon is it shows the the, the amazing freshness that that the Magaw Vineyard can can put out. Even in a year that was challenged with heat spikes, uh, fires, which we didn't have to deal with, um, it has that. It has that balance of like mostly red fruit, I think. With with a, we only use about seventy percent new oak, so we don't over oak the wine. And it has just that typical Maga freshness. 
you know, even in a year that was challenged with, with the heat. And so going back to the fires, so, you know, we can talk about smoke taint that maybe some people have. Mm -hmm. We also had to deal with like, we had no power. That's right. And then we had no labor. So when the fires hit, we had no power. We had to sneak into our wineries to process, which I did. I won't elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> got to do what you got to do sometime. Uh, yeah, I'm a sneaky little bitch. <laughs> um, and then, then we had people, like the whole valley evacuated because they didn't want to smell the smoke or they were scared or they didn't have power. And so there was multiple challenges in that year. You know, it wasn't just challenging vintage. It wasn't just smoke taint. You know, it was the heat waves. It was like labor. It was like, can you get in the winery? Do you have power? And uh, the dedicated people, uh, the true artisans, you know, made the best wine. It's true. It's true. It's only on the difficult time that you see the right people and the good people and the people putting all the energy and sneak around if they have to. And there's no, there's no other way to make wine. You know, you cannot just wait for the people and for the, uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, government to tell you, hey, you can get in now. No, it's too late. And yeah. no power in the winery when you have no power, when you do the pump over, when you have to get all those uh, product, I mean, those grapes inside, when you have to run also all your equipment, uh, you have to be sure you stabilize the fermentation. This is not fun. Uh, and I can feel that. And actually, we should charge more for the 17 because it was way more painful <laughs> uh, than, than it was in a regular and an easy, uh, easy vintage. What was your easiest vintage, uh, Mike? The easiest vintage was probably 13. 13. What was your most difficult vintage? 11. 11. Well, I'm not saying difficult, but like challenging. Challenging would be 11. 11. Of course. Yeah. 17 from what I just spoke about. I mean, yeah. we're, we're like, I had a friend who had a horse rescue and I had, I was in the back of their horse trailer. It took oh, wow. me to the winery because they're going to rescue horses. Yeah. <laughs> we sneak Jump around. With the horse. <laughs> um, you know, the most amazing thing about vintages is you never know what's coming at you. And uh, this will be my 21st coming up. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. I'm only 52, so I probably got another 20 in me. Well, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we need you we need we need good winemaker to make good wine that's what we are looking for but that's 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 the amazing thing about making wine you know is you never know what's coming at you and you use your experience and uh you get a little older every year you know and so you get more mature you get more experience you can adapt a little bit more quicker because you have all the data and the stuff that you've done in the past, but it's never the same. It's always something different. Yeah, and that's that's a, that's the amazing thing. I mean, and especially with California, when you intermix like the earthquake that we had five years ago. You know, I don't know if you guys know about that. Yeah. You know, it, you know Southern Napa, Yountville got destroyed, and Upper Valley didn't. And then you have fires, you have, now we have like power outages. So the PG&E is taking our power off as soon as the wind blows now. Yeah, because they're scared that then it's going to uh, start a new fire again. They need to change yeah. all the line. Absolutely. That's where, where tax money should go. Yeah, so it's not just the wineries, it's our homes too. Yeah. And so like I have a generator in, in my garage and- Everybody has a backup now. And we got our power shut off for three or four days last year, last harvest, and we fire up the generator, you know? And, uh, you know, people talk about global warming and other things, but that's like, that's like, like nothing comparable to the extremes of earthquakes, fire, power out, you know, taking our power off. You know, well, so we are human beings. We're very resilient. We, we need to, uh, you know, we, we see that during this very difficult time for the past three months. And I was amazed yesterday. I have actually some clients tell me, Bruno, where you been? I'm like, I don't know. Did you watch the news? He's like, 
I was waiting for you to stop by, which is, for me, it's, it's just a, a sense of the, the human being is resilient. The human being has a tendency to forget the bad stuff very quickly. So that's why I'm still very positive about what's going to happen to uh, our industry in the next few weeks or the next few months. I think we're going to recover very quickly. And I want to bring over, you know, the, the good positive energy to it. But we only need good wine to do what we do, meaning sharing the passion with you guys. And uh, Mike, thank you very much for the descriptive of this uh, of this wine and also your uh, past history and and your yeah. philosophy. Um, if so I don't, I'm, go I'm ahead. Mike. Something. What do you What do you guys think about this wine? Okay, here we go. Let's That's do it. That's what I was about to ask. Uh, does somebody want to take yeah. the lead of uh, the feeling of this wine? Who want to take the leads? Oh, Jack is on. Aaron. Jack is on. I can see it. I see his eye. He's ready. Yeah, uh, happy to. Hey, Mike, uh, first off, man, this is a, a fantastic wine. Uh, you know, I love the Rutherford AVA. Uh, it's been kind of like my favorite AVAs for some time now. For whatever odd reason, I haven't had a chance to uh, have any Rutherford AVA wines for some time. It's weird with a bunch of just different wines thrown at me. I just haven't had that chance, so it's very, very strange. Um, but I must admit, this is probably one of the if not the most like softest, elegant kind of cabs I've ever had um, in my life, man. There's, there's a lot going on here. It's such a clean cab, powerful for sure. You mentioned red fruits, but I'm actually getting more of the black and blue fruits, right? I'm getting so much of like that blueberry, that mm. plum for sure, such ripe and jammy fruits, right? Uh, some of the dry flower components, if it's non-fruits, and then some of the obviously the the earthy like the potting soil scenarios in the, in the you know obviously on, on the notes, right? Which is and, specific um, at Rutherford. Rutherford does have this dusty red red salt to it. Exactly, yeah. right? That Rutherford yeah. does. Obviously, that comes through. I decanted this wine at nine, so it was, about, it was a two hour decanting. And I remember once I opened up that bottle, I was like, wow, it was already screaming some of that. Oh my gosh, here here is that Rutherford kind of uh, nose, right? That I have been missing. Palette wise, oh my gosh, it's it's, it's so soft. So soft, so creamy, um, such a creamy palate. Uh, nothing kind of like, you know, it's, it's, not, it does, it's not hot, right? The heat doesn't really sing at all. Uh, I'm still getting a lot of those blue and black fruits. Uh, not as much earth on the palate than on the notes, for sure. Um, tannin wise, it's, it's there, medium, medium tannin for sure. Acidity, it's, it's low. Um, a very full body wine, but yet a very soft finish and creamy and elegant. So it's, Again, there's it's it's such a it's such a cool wine. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. So really the, great descriptive, like usual. Yeah. So one of the things that um, so I'm a I'm a complete wine geek. I have a cellar that, you know, I've been collecting wine. I hate to use the word collecting, but I do collect. I collect yeah. cards or other stuff. So whatever. And the one thing. You know, going back to my early twenties, I was. It's not a disease, uh, my darling. It's it's okay. Oh uh, yeah, it's it's a disease. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that I learned early on in my early twenties, uh, drinking wine or mid twenties, was that wines that are in balance are the wines that age the best. Hmm. And so I think a lot of times people make excuses like, "Oh, you just need to age us twenty years." And it'll be better. And so balance wines from the beginning will age better than wines that you think need to age to be better. I hope that made sense. Yeah, so with, sense. with the edge, you think it is, it's going to be perfect. I, I mean, I've never thought about that, but now that you mentioned that, I will try my best to find one of those unbalanced wines that I had in my notes and, and try to let that sit for a few years, five, ten years, and see if uh, it changes. And I, and I, you have to give you have to give a chance to the one like you do to your human being. Yeah, and so Not because someone is an asshole, they can be asshole all their life. Exactly. They Once an asshole, always an asshole. <laughs> it usually goes that way, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so in California, when people acidulate, so I'm I'm going to talk a little wine talk here. So maybe you can add half a gram per liter of granular acid to make your pH or make the, make the wine taste a little more acidified. Um, a lot of people will add four grams per liter of acidulated acid. And um, 
so when you taste California Cabernet Sauvignon specifically, if it, um, if it tastes a little shrill, I use the word shrill, um, that's acidulation. And so, you know, enology schools teach you to add enough granular acid to get the pH down to like 3.75 from like 3.9. So the wine you're drinking right now is probably a 3.9 pH. And in being 3.9, that means uh, from a, from a, like a collegiate or whatever term from the, from the schools, that means it's, it's not stable. So it can come down with bacterial or like bretomyas or other things. And that's, and so if you're, if you're working in a clean environment, you don't have to worry about your pH. Yeah. If you're working in a dirty environment, you have to worry about your pH. So like my environment and my winery, we don't, we don't bring barrels in or wine. We bring nothing on the property that will cross contaminate from other wineries. You learn from, you, you learn in a hard way or you just learn on your own? Well, what you have to do is you have to set your boundaries on your winery. Yeah. So you're not going to bring in like, I'm not going to use barrels from another winery. I'm not going to bring in bulk wine. And so we, we have, knock on wood, we have a very uh, non-bacterial bretomyas environment. Yeah, you don't want to bring the bacteria from outside to your winery. You want to be the most healthy and the most clean uh, to be sure that you don't have something that you can control, then you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah, and so what, what, the, what the schools teach you is to take your pH down to like 3.7, 3.75, because then microbes can't grow in it. Hmm. But, well, but we, bacteria we, adapt themselves. A marketing question uh, for Maddie, uh, because we all trade. And uh, uh, Matty, why, why you don't talk us about uh, the label? Because the label before was different. It was more like the 70s. And you change the label. So can you talk to us about the label a little bit? Because it's very, you, you, can, you can really see the, recognize the wine with the label. So can you talk to us about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, the label, again, kind of promotes the family nature of the vineyards and the wine and the winery and we purchased uh, we work with CF Napa which is a creative design firm in Napa Valley and they sourced we gave them the direction we want um, a young woman ties in with the name Scarlett Sherrod's daughter um, something that's very eye-catching and appealing something that we can utilize um, with minor color changes possibly or alterations across all the different varietals that we produce and they came back to us and they said, we found this, this illustrator in Italy and he has drawn this gorgeous uh, picture, illustration of this woman with this crazy hair and, and um, we think you guys sh should, should take a look at it. We want to make some alterations, maybe add some grape vines into the hair interwoven and it, they knocked it out of the park. Um, and so we adopted that new label Gosh, Mike, when you came on, were we still working with the old label? I think it was 2009, maybe, that we... Yeah, we had the old label. Yeah, so um, shortly thereafter bringing Mike on, we switched the label as well. Um, so not only did we have the powerhouse winemaker and quality in the bottle, um, we had some packaging that really was intriguing to customers. Um, so I've heard so many times, and it's it's really great that people are so pleasantly surprised when, when they actually taste the wine, because a lot of times people spend a ton of money on the labeling and the packaging and the wine's kind of a letdown. Um, so one of the best compliments we get time after time is, your label is amazing and gorgeous and intriguing, and then the wine is equally as impressive. Yeah, it's all a relationship between the elegance of the label and the elegance of the winemaking, and I think that's make this, uh, this product such a unique item. Right. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Hey, the piece of art. I mean, looking at the label for for most of the people that I'm working that I'm working with, every time they see this label, it's a, it's so attractive, it's so elegant. Uh, it's very embedding, and you know, the most important thing for for the consumer is when they see a product, when they see a wine, 
is to grab the ball from the shelf. And that's, that's what we want them right. to do. So I think this label make a huge, uh, huge impact on the shelf. But again, the relationship between the elegance of the wine and the elegance of wine making for me is the most important. And I think that's mission accomplished for sure. Yeah, on that note, wait till you guys try the 18 that we're going to bottle in July of the Cabernet Sauvignon in the 19s. They're, they're out of control. They are. And the, Sign me up. Sign the, me up. Yeah, the 18, like Zinfandel and Petit Syrah that we bottled in March are off the hook. I don't know if you've had them yet. Not yet. Know. I'm waiting for my samples. Maddie, Maddie, we need samples. 10-4. 10-4, 10-4. Got it. Superb. Um, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, this is obviously, I'm trying to make these meetings one hour because I know everybody is pretty busy. If anyone wants to, want to add anything to this meeting, they are welcome to do so. I am going to present the prices. I promise you that we're going to pass on some special, unique, prices then only going to be available for you guys present at this meeting for like a week so uh maddie helped me out big time on this i hope i was not too harsh on her asking better price or asking very good attractive price it was it's i know it's below than